Welcome everyone to the first of our webinar series for 2022. And this is a series organized by the Web3D Consortium and its members. Um, we're looking forward to a great series of sort of technical um, webinars, kind of like we might have today, and also applications from our members. So over the course of the year, we'll see a lot of highlights of X3D and of course the all the amazing applications of X3D. So today we're here um, and I'd like to welcome everyone. My name is Nicholas Paulus. I'm the elected president of the Web3D Consortium, which is our not-for-profit organization uh, with international membership around the world. And we're really uh, lucky and thrilled to have um, one of our members uh, with us today to present some of his work, Michaelis Camborellis. He was um, the 2021 Web3D Member of the Year and has continued to do amazing uh, work with the X3D specification and, and its implementation uh, through his open source Castle Game Engine. So we're going to learn a lot about how um, <clears throat> uh, Michaelis and, and the X3D specification have kind of approached this new opportunity, right? Which is, hey, look, we've... Um, We've been working with 3D content for two decades, and thankfully, because of the ISO standards, we haven't lost a triangle. And, and that's really important for Virginia Tech and our research enterprise. Um, but lately, you know, we've got a, a real new opportunity with this kind of visual fidelity that um, formats like GLTF provide uh, through specification of physically based rendering. And so we've got a new level of visual fidelity that's possible. And it's also nice and performant, right? We can just give those arrays right to the GPU, no parsing, we're off and running. So there's a lot of advantages to integrating a format in X3D4, which is the new newest version of X3D, undergoing uh, ISO review and process uh, at the moment, is <clears throat> has a number of features. And from web3d.org, you can find on the homepage, the X3D4.0 link, to sort of see some of those highlights. And I guess I just wanted to put one more piece of context to, um, to the effort here. So as you've heard about GLTF and it's sort of being branded as the, the JPEG of 3D. And this is really great because, you know, we want a fast transmission format for our models. And, um, you know, if they're not lit or static or interactive, we can describe them in GLTF. But if we want to then do something with them, like put a JPEG in a web page and add some application logic, right? We need some other stuff. And that's really where X3D excels at building a scene graph and defining interactive semantics for how it is rendered and, and run. So having kind of X3D and GLTF together is really the best of both worlds. And what we've done in X3D4 is to align those specifications so that uh, authors can confidently mix and match um, this kind of content. So I'm really uh, thankful for everyone to be here. Thank you so much. And um, we're going to pass it over now, I guess, to um, our speaker, Michaelis, and he'll get us underway with the content for today's webinar. Are you able to get the screen, Michaelis? Uh, yeah, uh, I will actually uh, share the screen in a second. Let me just okay. do uh, then a quick introduction. So, yes. hi, hello, everybody. Thank you for the great introduction. So, uh, so yeah, so a few words about this talk. So, I will talk about a few, I guess, interconnected things. So, as Nicolas said, like XVD and GLTF, we will talk a lot about the alignment. And in particular, I will talk about some things that I have been working on with regards to X3D4 specification, which is the physically based rendering, and actually some other connected stuff related to the materials and textures. Uh, in general, I hope that this will be like a kind of both uh, very accessible uh, webinar. I mean, I do actually want to present even a short introduction to XVD at the beginning, but then a uh, warning, I, I, I will want to go into some kind of uh, technical details uh, that, that are interesting to me and I hope they will be interesting to you too. So I do hope that this will be both introductory, but also kind of getting into advanced points that will like, I guess, satisfy everybody. 
uh, a general warning like this is a live webinar <laughs> i'm not used to do web pre recorded <laughs> webinars since covid but this one is live so i guess there will be some hiccup but if anything is unclear or anything just shout at me write to me in the chat and I'm a leaf person right now. And okay, so before I start sharing, just a few words about myself. Uh, actually, Nicolas already said <laughs> very good words about me. So, so about myself, I'm doing Castle Game Engine and View 3D Scene. It's an open source game engine and an open source viewer for 3D formats. And uh, yeah, I'm a member of Web3D. I'm a liaison between Web3D and Kronos. And I really want to have like both cakes. I mean, I want to have perfect XVD, I want to have perfect GLTF. I'm interested in them because I'm, I'm really using them. I mean, my engine is like using both of these standard 3D formats for, well, displaying essentially everything. So I'm, I'm very interested in making both these formats, well, actually, well, yeah, suitable for my purpose, which is game development, which means I just want them to cooperate together nicely. And I will also show some things related to my engine during this presentation, but I will try not to focus too much on it. I will rather try to make it like a general presentation about XVD and GLTF and how it connects to GLTF. Um, okay, so after this short introduction, let me share the screen and I will actually start um, showing some stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, that's, that's one of the hiccups. That's my cat. Uh, no, he's not a hiccup. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, a short overview. So, uh, XVD is a, is a format for 3D models. That's as, as, as concise summary as I can get to it. It allows you to define a number of things, in particular geometry, which is just meshes, and how these meshes look like in the three dimensional world. I will show how it looks like. Uh, the physical based rendering that I will talk about is like a modern technique for showing the materials in a way that well, looks nice and looks modern. And I will also talk about normal maps, which is kind of a way to show uh, small fractures, not just fractures, just small details on your surfaces. And I'm going to show how to just use it all in XVD. And I'm going also to show how to mix GLTF with XVD. And yeah, and that's it. So let's start with a very short overview of how the XVD looks like. So as I said, it's just a, it's just a feed format for 3D graphics, right? So um, you can export to it from various applications. But to be honest, what I want to show to you, what I want to start right now, is just to show how you can actually write XVD end of yourself, because it's not really that much, uh, because it's kind of easy, that's what I want to say. And this way I will be able to show you kind of uh, the details, how does everything work in XVD. So at the beginning, XVD is just a text file. It's a text file. You can use an XML encoding. You can use something called classic encoding. I will mostly use classic encoding in this presentation because it's just easier to write for a human, right? And, ah, and you should see my screen right now with the amazing text editor, MX. Is, is everybody clear here? I mean, do you see it? Yes, thank you. We have it. OK, cool. So this is how the usual X3D uh, file starts. I have just declared that it's using version four right now. And what you can do inside the X3D file is you can use a number of nodes. There are uh, over a hundred actually nodes defined by the X3D specification, but you definitely don't need to know them all. Actually at the beginning, you only need to know a few of them just to, to, to display something useful. So I guess one of the most useful things is shape. Shape is a container for what you would often call a mesh, which is a, just a set of triangles for the modern graphics, and some appearance, which means how to display this mesh. How, what color does it have? What texture does it have? And so on. So inside the shape, you can define, um, inside all of the XVD nodes, you can define a number of fields, and these fields can have values. So for example, I'm not saying that the shape node has a field called geometry. And this field called geometry, it should define how does the, what is the mesh, how does the mesh look like, which means what triangles are part of it. 
And there are a number of ways to define a mesh. One of the most versatile is the indexed face set. And this is really like what you would call a mesh in most cases. It's a set of triangles. I can go one by one, specify each triangle, actually each polygon. How does it look like? But of course, you also have some, let's call them shortcuts. So for example, I can just say that, okay, my shape is a sphere, okay? So that's an easy way to get a sphere. And for example, I can say here that, okay, I want the sphere. The sphere has a default radius one, so I actually don't have to write it, but I can say, oh, I want a larger sphere. So I want a sphere with radius 10, okay? And that's it. I mean, I will extend it in a second, but that's your basic XVD5, okay? So using two nodes, shape node and the sphere node, and we have defined something that, that um, that looks like a sphere, okay? So now I have opened the sphere with view 3D scene. This is my uh, 3D browser for, for XVD and GLTF models. It's open source, you can download it. The, the links are in the presentation material. Uh, yeah, it's just an open source viewer for, for these files. So this is the default sphere. It's kind of boring because it's completely unlit white material, right? Because this is the default in XVD. In general, a decision in XVD is that uh, if something is not specified, then try to take a um, reasonable, but also very effective, uh, optimal, fast to display approach. So by default, if you don't say what material does the sphere have, then it has an unlit white material. So but kind of boring, but well, of course we can adjust now. So I can use another field called appearance, where I can use another node called appearance. And here I can say, how does the sphere should look like? I mean, what color should it have? What, what texture should it have? And so on and so on. So now the, uh, the way to specify materials in XVD, and this is so far what I'm talking about is that it applies equally to XVD version three and version four. Uh, so far. So for example, if I want to say that I want to use a material which is using the classic Fong uh, lighting model. So like we, we will get to the new stuff in a second, but this is like the classic material. And for example, I want to say that the diffuse color is yellow. Yeah, so I'm going to do it like this. And that's actually it. Let me now just reload the sphere. And this is it. This is the yellow sphere. And uh, this actually concludes the very first part of my presentation. So this is, I think, a five minute. Did I manage it? I think yes. So more or less five minute introduction into what XVD is and uh, how can you use it. Yeah? So, so if you want to like learn yourself about all these nodes, you can of course go to the web 3 uh, web page that was mentioned, uh, that, that Nicolas mentioned. You can go to the standards, recommended standards, and you will find there an XVD version 4 and XVD version 3, all their standards, and they specify all these nodes. I mean, all these uh, shape nodes, the, 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 the appearance material, all these things are specified there. What, what are the fields that you can use? What are their default values? And what is their meaning, of course? Um, okay, so I, I hope that this was like a good introduction to XVD. Ah, actually, there's one other thing, because I'm showing you right now what is called kind of a classic encoding of XVD. This classic encoding is kind of nice to write for humans. It resembles a bit, well, some programming language, right? But uh, for processing with, well, okay, but there's another encoding and it's often more, uh, more comfortable actually to process by applications. This another encoding is the XML encoding. It's actually too, uh, too, too boring to write to the big end. So I will just generate it automatically. You can use the view 3D scene for that. You can use save as XVD, XML encoding. And there you have, it produced another field with the extension just XVD and it looks like this. So there's just XVD, like, like some XML boilerplate, let's call it. And, but the, the, like, the core part of the file, as you can see, is the same thing. It's just expressed now using XML elements. So there's an XML element called sphere, XML element called material. It's contained within appearance and everything is contained within the shape XML node. And this is the XML encoding of X3D. The important point of X3D is that you can use all of these encodings. There's classic, there's XML, there's also binary encoding. You can use all those encodings. They are like interchangeable. I mean, there you can perform a perfect conversion without losing anything between any of these encodings in any way and uh, 
that they really express precisely the same thing. It's just a way of, do you like XML or do you like just this custom custom syntax that is, I guess, a bit nicer for humans? Um, okay, so that's, so this is like really the end of the first part of the presentation, like what is XVD? And now I want to like jump into uh, in, in, into like more specific things that, 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 that I wanted to cover in this webinar, which is what we have done in XVD version 4, in particular with regards to materials and lighting and some textures. Uh, so, ah, and actually let me open the specification at this point, uh, just to show you that everything I'm saying, like it's available, like all the specification, um, everything I'm saying basically, it actually follows the specification that we have written, so you can read about it yourself. For example, this is the XVD version 4 specification of the material node. So you can see that, okay, the material node, it has fields like diffuse color, and a number of other fields. <laughs> so the first thing, and this is actually the first thing that we have done in XVD version 4. In XVD version 3, the material was kind of, well, much simpler and had less features. In XVD version 4, one of the core um, features that we have added is that everything, every parameter of the material can be customized by a texture. So you see here some groups. So basically everything has a texture. So you have a diffuse color and you have diffuse texture. You have emissive color and emissive texture. And this pattern is repeated uh, <laughs> everywhere. Yeah? So, well, okay, normal map is just a normal map, but occlusion, uh, no, sorry, occlusion is also occlusion. But you have a shininess and a shininess texture, specular color, specular textures, and so on uh, for ambient. And the same approach will be used for the other material parameters. So the way, if I would like to use it, right? So I have started here to write it, okay? I have a diffuse color, okay? So I can say, okay, let me customize this diffuse color by a diffuse texture, okay? And what I can place in the diffuse texture is another XVD node. Um, there are a few ways to specify texture in XVD. The simplest one is the image texture node. It's just a regular 2D texture file, okay? Nothing fancy. And here I'm just going to use um, any file, any, any file that I will like right now find on my disk. And I will use it as a texture. Let me just take any PNG. Okay, let me paste it here. Uh, this is the image that I'm going to use as a texture, okay? Because that's just the first thing I found on my disk. And so I'm just specifying the name of this file here. It's just a regular PNG file. And that's it. Let me just reload the, 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 the model now in a view 3D scene. And you will see it's textured. It's, it's a sphere, so it doesn't really look that, uh, that uh, it's, it's not that easy to grasp because it's happening here. Okay, it will look a bit better on a box. Okay, and this is a texture applied on a box. The default texture mapping on a cube is such that on every face of the cube, well, the texture is like displayed as a whole. So the texture is visible six times on this cube. And as you can see, it got a bit yellowish, right? And that's another thing that we have followed closely in XVD version 4, that in all these cases, when you have uh, something like a color or a factor, and they are combined with a texture, so the word combined, it always means multiply. So you multiply diffuse color with the texture, and it's, this, it's a component-wise multiplication in this case. And we do this multiplication basically for anything that you will specify here. So right now it's a bit yellow. If I would like, for example, if I can comment this, then by default it will be like almost white color. So it will look more like this, yeah? And, uh, yeah. and I can customize everything in this way. Um, okay. So, so this is one thing that we have added in XVD version 3, that you can customize all these things with the parameters, because for example, on the Fong uh, lighting model, aside of the diffuse, you have something like a specular, and the specular is like the color of your highlights. So when the light shines on something, well, it has a certain color. Let me actually then uh, maybe use a teapot and first show you where's the specular color, okay? So as you can see, like this big, like shiny things, when the light falls on the surface, 
Well, this is the specular reflection. So I can make the specular reflection. I mean, I can color this specular reflection with anything I want. By default, it's, it should be like kind of white. It's not very much visible here because it's just a bright model. But when I made it red, I bet that you have seen this like bright red spot on my teapot. And that's because it's red because I just said that my specular color is red. And if I wanted to, I could say that, okay, I have the specular color. And of course I can say that, all right, I also have a specular texture. So actually it doesn't have to be, have a red highlight, just pure red. It can have a highlight that varies across the surface. Now this demo doesn't really have much sense because this image is definitely a, not a good image to use for a specular highlight. I will show you, a, I guess, a bit more sensible demo in a second, but right now I'm just showing you the way that it works, okay? And I have used the teapot because I hope that it will show some nice reflections. That I, I see it work like hard work. Um, okay, so that's uh, like basic the idea of the material, okay? A number of factors and the number of colors, all customizable by a texture. Now let me actually show you some, well, not very much impressive, but well, prepared beforehand demos, instead of just inventing things on the fly. So you have here enhanced font material, and this is an extremely boring demo of a just material with the diffuse color and something extra. As you can see, when you look at it at a certain angle, you can see some small details across the surface. Let me actually open another demo with it. That's a book mapping test, and this already tells you what it is. So the idea is that you can add specify within the material node also a normal map which is used to make a bump mapping, which in human terms just means that you can have very small details on the surface, like something is more uh, like a fractures, like small details that are more in front or in the back, and the lighting behaves natural. So when the lighting is moving across all these things, you can see that it like small details get highlighted in a kind of natural way. And the actual meshes underneath, they are very simple, right? Because this is what is happening underneath when you think about the meshes. I mean, this is actually what is happening underneath, yes? So just uh, boring boxes and spheres with triangles, yes? But then uh, when you, well, first of all, you fill them and then you apply on them the textures, then you get all these nice details visible. And that's thanks to the bump mapping. Let me just show you very quickly how does it look like in the actual file because there's a, well, it's easy. So the way it looks like is you specify within the material, instead of saying nothing, you specify that you have a normal texture. Okay, so this is the snippet that you are interested in. So you can say that I have some diffuse texture and that I have some normal texture. And normal texture is a texture that specifies how the normal vectors vary across the surface. It's encoding the normal vectors in something called tangent space, which means that it's, it's usually blue because blue means that the vector, the normal vector like points outwards from the polygon. So that's why the normal maps are usually blue. Uh, if you're interested about creating such normal maps, you can take a look, for example, at GIMP that has a plugin to actually make it in 2D or in Blender or 3ds Max or Maya or basically any other 3D authoring software. It allows you to kind of bake the high poly version of your model, for example, that you have sculpted or done in any other technique. You can like bake this high poly version of your model into a texture. And then you can have a low poly version of your model that is much more efficient to display and to use with it this normal texture. And this way, as I shown here, you kind of get these nice details when the light moves across the surface. But at the same time, your actual geometry stays very simple. You're just displaying kind of rectangles, boxes here. Uh, for example, this leaf here. Yeah? So this leaf that you see here is really just, okay, it happened to be more than a, than a simple square because um, that's how I chose to render it for some unrelated reasons, but it could be just a single square. And, uh, but the texture, the normal map texture makes it visible with some fine details. Mm, okay, 
So I think that's uh, more or less the second part of my presentation. Let me see, do I have here some other things? Ah, yes, well, we have added some, a number of other things to the existing material, the found material node. Like you can, uh, this emissive color was already present, but you can also customize the emissive color with a texture or with just a color. Here you can see a normal map, normal texture combined with a blue emissive color. It doesn't look sensible, that's kind of deliberate. It's just a test that it works. And uh, here are various tests that you can adjust, like ambient using a texture. You can adjust the shininess using a texture. So this creates a, a, a surface that has a, like a, when the lighting falls on the surface, I hope you can see that to the screen share. So when the lighting falls on the surface, it behaves differently depending on exactly which part of the surface it is touching. Um, so you can express such things like rust and so on. And here is some demo that you can explain, uh, express different highlights. So here you have a box that has on the left side yellow specular highlights and on the right, you have a blue specular highlights. And that's just because I have used here a very simple texture that, uh, that just has yellow on the left side. I can actually show it to you. Um, this should be this. Oh, yeah, so oh, it looks like this. Uh, let me, ah, I hope this it's visible enough in Emacs, okay? Ah, it's good. Uh, so yeah, so this is how this specular uh, shininess texture looks like. So it's yellow on the left, blue on the right. That's that's better, if I'm in my case. I mean, if I'm in my photos. <laughs> in my cat. I mean. um, okay, so this is, I guess, a short presentation that I, that I wanted to tell about what we have done for the materials, for the classic XVD3 materials using the Fong lighting models. So, Everything can have a texture, and you have a normal maps, and uh, and it's also backward compatible. I mean, if you have used XVD version three already, then it's all backward compatible. I mean, all the new stuff, it's uh, well, you can use it, but if you don't use it, it's all working as it was in XVD version three. So we have also added two new material nodes. Uh, one is the unlit material. Uh, it's, I guess, kind of self-explanatory. It's a material that just has a simple emissive color. And it can, can also have an emissive texture, of course, but really nothing more. It's a great material to use when you want to use, uh, well, non-realistic shading, like a cartoon shading. If you want to draw yourself on the surface, then unlit material is what you want to use if you don't want to use any lighting calculations. Okay, uh, actually I do have here some demos of it. We actually have made a whole game using uh, Spine and in Catastrophe Games, the, 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 the company that I'm co-owner, we are using, we have used my engine, custom game engine, which means we have used XVD uh, to render a two-dimensional game, a uh, platformer game, adventure game too. And it's using the Spine animation software and underneath, we just use this to convert the Spine models into XVD models, into XVD models that use unlit material uh, actually everywhere because it's a, like it's a cartoon graphics. Let me just see. I didn't prepare this presentation beforehand, but let me just see, well, can I very quickly find some cool animation showing what I mean? Oh, actually, here it is, okay? So this is really an XVD model. I mean, at the point when I'm reading it, it's now just a set of XVD nodes, and they all use the unlit material node for displaying. And well, yeah, it has a number of animations. This is kind of a it's a monster lady, essentially. And yeah, it's it's animated using XVD, it's lit using XVD. So all you see right now is just an XVD model. Uh, I, I'm, I'm importing it from Spine, but I could, for example, save it as an XVD, and you would see that it's just a set of XVD nodes at this point where I'm rendering it, okay? Do I have something less scary? I can see, can I have something less scary? Ah, undead village, vampire house, only scary things, I'm very sorry, uh, lots of scary things, <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, now I will not try to invent the, the example beforehand, it's a, it's a cool game, you can find it on Steam, uh, uh, and as I emphasize, it's using an elite material node to display basically everything, I'm using, using Spine to create those animations. 
Uh, okay, what's more? Uh, ah, and I also saw the last, uh, not the last, but yes, the last, but I guess the one of the most important new material notes that we have added in X3D version 4 is the physical material. There's a, there's a typo here, so it should say physical material. And this is the material that allows you to do physical based rendering. And it's very, it's consistent, it's absolutely deliberately consistent with the way with the naming and with the way how it works with the GLTF. So let me just try to first write something by hand. Okay. So let's do it like this. Okay, so maybe that's a good start. All right. And this is kind of a boring example of a physical material. Okay, so it's kind of grayish by default. As you saw, well, everything by default is boring, but then you can put interesting textures and colors to it, and then it gets more interesting. So if I would want to say that the physical material is yellow, for example, then I would use the term base color, okay? So it doesn't have, it doesn't even have the diffuse color field anymore. So this would be incorrect. I cannot even talk about the diffuse colors when I talk about the physical materials. Because the physical materials have a different set of parameters. It has the base color, uh, the roughness, and the metallic parameters. And so at the basic level, let's just adjust the base color to be yellow, and it looks like this. So it's a bit yellowish. It's actually a bit of greenish, I think, but that's because of the lighting. The lighting could also be adjusted. I will talk about lights in a second. And of course, you can do well, much more interesting stuff with this physical based rendering material. Let me now open some well, better demos than I could have invented right now. Uh, so first, let's start with something very basic. Okay, still kind of boring. But then you can also use normal maps, of course, with the physical material nodes. And then you can, for example, open something like this. And this is actually a model completely in XVD, but you have not done it within XVD. It's converted from GLTF. But at this point, when I'm reading it, it's just an X, a set of XVD nodes using the physical material node and for displaying everything. And it has a nice uh, highlights using the physical based rendering. I can even activate here a lighting that will make it, well, more bright from all the sides. I will talk about it more in a second. So it can look like this, okay? And if you look underneath, you can like kind of see that I'm not, uh, I'm not lying essentially, which means that everything I show is really just using this simple notes, physical material note that I started talking about. Uh, actually, let's go for this full version, okay? So this is the full version of this damaged helmet model. And as you can see, it just has a shape let me kind of deconstruct it, okay? So if I would deconstruct it, you would see that it has a shape that has geometry indexed triangle set. As you can guess, it's just a set of triangles. And then a number of numbers follows that have been exported from the software. I don't know what was the original software used to create this, but obviously no human was writing these numbers. That's just a software that have generated them. And then you have a number of, and then you have an appearance node that contains the physical material node that contains a number of settings. So you have here uh, colors, you have here textures, and well, they all play nicely together. So this is basically what you can achieve if you put a graphic artist to prepare a demo instead of telling me to like you know, show you a teapot. Uh, so this looks good. Um, okay, what more do I want to talk about? So everything here is still adjustable by the textures. Let me actually show you the X3D specification of it. Okay, I mentioned the unlit material earlier. So there it is. And what I'm talking about right now is the physical material. And as you can see, it's all nicely specified here. And it's very much consistent with the previous, the older Fong material, right? So you have base color and the base texture. You have emissive and emissive texture and so on and so on. You have a metallic roughness here, for example. And as an exception, they are kind of can be customized by one common texture, metallic roughness texture. We follow here what GLTF is actually specifying too, because that's so very common thing that you want to adjust by, the, by a texture, both metallic and roughness parameters. So they are placed in different channels of the metallic roughness texture. Uh, and you have also occlusion. I do have some demo of occlusion. Uh, 
I'll show it in a second. Uh, so this is kind of the main thing I wanted to show about the physical material. And uh, yes, let me actually show the inclusion now. Well. Just find it. Oh, like here. It's, um, I'm not sure which one, to be honest, will be very much impressive. I don't think, I think neither of them is very much impressive. But well, this is a model where we have applied some occlusion texture. Occlusion texture is kind of a way of saying that uh, you want to, it's called ambient occlusion often. It's a way of saying that you have generated a texture. It's usually just an intensive texture that specifies that some parts of your model are darker than the other, other parts. For example, you can generate such occlusion texture using Blender. And for example, it could mean that this texture, for example, right here, when the hand connects to the torso, right? So you can kind of see as a human that this part underneath uh, your, your, your hand, your armpit, right? It, 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 it is usually dark. The light doesn't reach there. So the occlusion texture is a way to express it using a texture. And let me actually just show this texture uh, to you. How does it look like? Uh, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, where can I find the fusion texture? Fusion strength, as you can see it in the XML encoding. And the occlusion texture looks like this. Let me make it zoom out a bit. Okay, so just a grayscale texture with some parts a bit brighter, some parts a bit darker. If you would apply it on a 3D model, like in Blender or anywhere else, you would see that the dark parts, they correspond to the parts that are usually obscured because of the mesh construction. They usually obscure the lighting. So that's kind of the occlusion texture is a way to express that some parts of your mesh are darker than the others, right? So that's like, I guess, a quick demo of the occlusion texture. Um, okay. uh, so I think this about covers what I wanted to talk about the materials. So the short version, we have three material nodes, physical material, all the phone material that is called just material for backward compatibility and the analytic material. Uh, now, some other things that we have done in the XVD version 4 is, okay, we still have the same lights as you know. So we have the point lights, spotlight, directional lights. Uh, they work the same way and they are consistent with the GLTF punctual lighting. So if you go to the lighting component specification, you will see that we have a, like, a lot of a lot of equations have been upgraded, but essentially the set of lights that you have is the same. Well, with one exception, I mean, we are working right now on something called environment light. This means this is often called image-based lighting. And the idea is that you have a lighting that is kind of defined as a cube map. It's a lighting that shines from all the direction of the wall. It shines on your surface. It's a great light to simulate, for example, an outdoor lighting because outdoor lighting isn't really like, you know, a one thing that shines on you. Outdoor lighting in practice, in, in, in reality, it's more like from all the direction you have, you get some brightness, you get some, some contribution uh, to make your models brighter. And that's what image-based lighting allows you to express. And that's what our environment light allows you to express. We are still working on it, how to express it precisely. Uh, I will show you a demo, actually, how it partially already works. We know that we will want to express it in a way that is consistent with also what the GLTF is planning. GLTF has now uh, two extensions for it. The newer one is called the uh, image uh, and Volcanos. Uh, and viral light environment. So this is something that, that we will cage uh, air lights environment. So this is like the new extension of GLTF that is still like in progress, how this kind of light will work in GLTF. We absolutely know that we will want to make the environment light in XVD consistent with uh, what is specified in the GLTF. Um, as a kind of preview, I can show you what we already have in XVD then. Uh, what, what I, yeah what I have implemented and what I think is a good basis. So the environment light, 
it's, uh, I mean, we have one thing actually here, like, like, like already good in XVD, because XVD specification already expresses a number of ways how you can specify a cube map texture. Okay, so if you look at the XVD specification, you can find the whole cube map texturing component, environmental texturing component, and it already specifies a few ways, uh, three ways, how to specify the cube map texture. So you can specify a separate two dimensional texture for all six sides of the cube. Uh, you can generate a cube map, which means that uh, at, the, at the time of rendering, you can actually capture the environment around into a texture. Or you can say uh, have an image cube map texture where you can specify a texture using DDS or KTX. I would actually at this point recommend to use the KTX, which is the Kronos format for um, textures with a lot of features interesting for, for, for well, 3D visualization. So you can use DDS or KTX file format to express an image cube map texture. And uh, yeah, and then you kind of specify all the six sides of the cube and using one texture. So let me just uh, show you, I guess, one of these examples. For example, this is the image cube map texture in this point using DDS format. And this says that, okay, I have now environment light and it is using this kind of texture. And this means that this texture defines the light contribution from all sides, how the light shines on my surface. Um, let me, I, I will actually first show you the demo and then I will show you how does this texture looks like. So this is the cube map image. All right. So if you move around here, you will see that there are some like a hint of clouds shining on these spheres and other uh, and other meshes. I think it looks actually best on the teapot. So I'm often using a teapot. And this is, I guess, most like, and this is what, what it would look like if you would just use this cube map texture on a regular teapot, using it as a, as a diffuse texture or as a base texture. For this example, it kind of doesn't matter, okay? So you have this texture that kind of simulates there's some ground underneath, there's some sky above, and it lights on your surface. And if you use this texture as an environment light, you get these kinds of effects. So it shines on everything in your world, making it brighter from all sides, but with some nice variation. And this kind of corresponds how these things could look in, in, a, in a real world if you would like place them outside and shine a bright light on them. And just if you're curious, I'm just going to actually show you how does this te texture exactly look like because there's like, I, I kind of want to like dispel any myths, myths that it's like a magic texture or anything. I mean, it's not magic, it's just a texture that actually contains six two-dimensional textures inside. I'm now using my own image viewer and it allows me to view like sub image inside DDS or KTX file. And I'm using that as just a keyboard shortcut to switch between various textures. So a DDS texture, in this case, it's just a six regular two-dimensional textures. And as I've shown, you can kind of use it as a source for environment light, which allows to make everything brighter from all the sides. Okay? So this is what we are working on in terms of lighting. Uh, another small thing that we have made uh, for all the lights is that lights have now unbounded intensity, and the intensity has also the relation to the reality um, it's basically kind of a natural thing and it follows the GLTF specification. Uh, let me just show you what it is. Uh, this should be specification. Uh, okay, in the physical lighting model, the intensity value should correspond. And here you can have actually the physical like interpretation of what this intensity is supposed to mean. And as you can see in the specification, the intensity, although by default it is one, is actually unbounded, which means it can have any value up to the infinity. And this follows the reality. In reality, there are no bounds on how bright things can be. Things can be arbitrarily bright. So that's what we have also made for XVD lights. Yeah. Uh, actually, this covers what I wanted to talk about lights. I also talked about the textures already a lot. So let me just mention just without demo, then one important thing that we have made uh, that we have changed in XVD version 4 in regards to texture. 
it is that we have made the treatment of grayscale and RGB textures mm, well, simpler and more consistent with essentially everything else. Grayscale texture in XVD version 4 is just equivalent to an RGB texture that has all the three channels, red, green, blue, equal. Um, yeah, and, and I think this is consistent with actually every other software, so this should not be a surprise for you. A long story short, in XVD version 3, it was a bit more complicated. There were some details where the grayscale texture was treated or was supposed to be treated a bit differently than RGB texture, but it's simpler now. Okay, this one I already shown. Uh, okay, so let's now jump to the things actually more connected with GLTF. I mean, I already like told you that everything in the physical material is absolutely consistent with the GLTF specification. GLTF also has a base, metallic roughness, and they work in exactly the same way. Actually, right now in the XVD specification, we even say that if you could do the physical lighting calculation, just use the equations in the appendix to the GLTF specification. We want to actually make it clarify it to, 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 to write, write these equations explicitly in the XVD specification. But the point is that those equations in XVD, they will match exactly what GLTF is saying. And that's a deliberate choice that we want them to match exactly. Okay. Uh, so what more you can do? Well, you can also, uh, as, as Nicolas said, like we, we can kind of use the fact that we, there's a large ecosystem of GLTF models and we want to kind of enjoy it. It allows you to kind of mix XVD with GLTF models. And the traditional and the still good way to mix models in XVD is the inline node. Let me first uh, show it. Uh, let me first show it uh, independently of the, of, the, of, of the GLTF stuff, okay? So, for example, assume that I have a model called B.xvd3. And this model defines a sphere. Uh, no, I have used this sphere already in this webinar. So, column, okay? This time the column. And uh, well, let's make it just a regular material that has a diffuse color. I know I made a typo. Okay? So, this is kind of a boring yellow column, okay? Now I can define, I can now say that, okay, in another field, uh, like this a.x3d, well, not only I want to have my teapot, I want to also include another file. And the way to include another file is exactly this inline node. And it looks trivially like this. So I use the URL field, and I say that to load another field from the a.x3dv uh, file. Okay? And... Uh, that's mostly it, although it will not, you will see what is like the, I guess the mistake I have made in this model, but I can already open it, it's valid. Um, ah, okay, yeah, because I, okay. that was a recursive dependency. I said to load A inside A. I don't want that. I want to load B. And this is the cone connected with the teapot. They start uh, at the same place. I knew that I made this mistake. If I wanted to, I could, of course, shift them. So I can use the transform node in XVD version 3, and uh, transform node in XVD, all the versions of the transform node. And I can say that the thing that I want to transform is this inline node. And it looks like this. And that's the model. That's a boring model, but demonstrating what I mean here. I mean, you can just connect two files this way. So you can have something in your, let's say, parent file, and you can inline a child file. Ah, I'm going to use this terminology. So yeah, you can inline a child file this way inside your outer file. Okay. And the point that I'm going to make is that you can use this but in case of my engine but this is actually at least FreeWRL and uh, xfdom i think they also want to support it this way is that you can also include other uh, model uh, field types this way so for example you can say that i want to include gltf this way i want to include spine this way uh, I want to include wavefront obj this way uh, you can include the, the, the stl file this way in that this is not everything here is supported by every every browser, uh, but the point is that it can be. And I'm going to show you how it looks like in case of the GLTF. So um, let me actually just. Uh, take. 
and GLTF field I have, maybe this one. Uh, let me just let me first show you. Okay, so this is a GLTF file of a soldier. You can even animate it like this. And then let me take this soldier. Now oh, it's already in the current directory. So now I can inline the soldier inside my larger XVD file. Okay. At the beginning, it will not really achieve much. I mean, I'm just really opening the GLTF file. Okay. So this is how the a.xvdv looks like now. It's just including the GLTF file. It's not really that useful. I could also just open directly the GLTF file, of course. But, well, what I can do right now is that I can add all this XVD stuff on top of it. I mean, I, I, can, I can enhance this thing with all the things that we have this, uh, defined in XVD. So, for example, let me multiply the soldier. So I can say that there's one soldier at this position, another at this position, another at this position, and another at this position. I could do it in a more efficient way, but this one will also work. Um, did I make a mistake here? Ah, because I want to run. Now load the XVD file. And this is how it looks like, okay? So I have duplicated the GLTF file a few times. And of course, I can like mix it now with everything I shown you previously. I mean, I can still use XVD stuff here and do the teapot. I seem to enjoy the teapot today. So I can mix it with all the things available in the XVD specification for me. We like yellow today, so we we'll go like this. And this would be an amazing presentation where you saw the four soldiers and one teapot. I bet you never saw that one before. So you can mix XVD things and GLTF things. And uh, yeah, uh, what, more, what more did I did I want to talk about? Ah, yes. Uh, so, uh, in case, like, um, so this is like a, a kind of a message to, to all the XVD browser implementers. I mean, the way the conversion, you can take the GLTF model and the way you can convert it to the XVD nodes, well, it's not exactly specified in the XVD specification because we don't want right now to force you uh, to have a specific approach to convert GLTF models into XVD. But we do have a set of guidelines, and I would very much welcome all the XVD browser implementers to kind of uh, contribute. And like, let's talk about what is the best way to express this or that GLTF concept using XVD. And the page where those guidelines are present is linked from the materials to this talk. And here I try to place a, a lot of like knowledge that I, that I guess gained from implementing it, how you can convert various GLTF things into XVD things. So like GLTF mesh uh, converts to a group of shapes, GLTF primitive nodes convert to this, GLTF node is an XVD transform node, and so on and so on. So if you come here from a background of GLTF, you can also use kind of this page to like get a mapping, okay? So I know this term in GLTF, what should it be in XVD, okay? And actually there is a mapping for a lot of things, like they have a very good mapping that, 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 that works in the same way. Okay, so this is like, essentially it's, it's an information for everybody, but especially I would welcome the XVD browser implementers that are interested in GLTF to kind of take a look at this page. And as I say, contribute. I mean, these things are not set in stone. You can achieve some things in various ways. I very much want like to well, zero in on the perfect way to express some GLTF concepts using XVD nodes. And of course the, the like, important part that, that I emphasize in this presentation is that, for example, for GLTF materials, well, it's easy, right? Because for GLTF materials, you just convert them to the physical material node. That was like the initial push why we have added this physical material to XVD, that you can take the GLTF material, very easily express it using the XVD physical material, and it works. Yes, my cat Pedro wants attention. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, what more did I want to talk about? Uh, I wanted to just show some example that you can create a uh, field from Blender. You can create GLTF field from Blender too. That's kind of a given, but let me just show you this way. 
So this is the blender. Um, ah, let's not use the default boring thing. Uh, let me open something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so you're going. So this is going to be fun. Uh, the model I'm showing you right now is the model that we have created a week ago with my three-year-old daughter. It depicts a bowl or for a cat, where the cat has a foot, and the foot is shaped like small little hearts. <laughs> so we have made this thing with Yakota, my daughter. We had a lot of fun making it. So it's really like a, essentially a random model. I mean, I didn't choose any particular model for this presentation. I kind of want to show you that, well, it, it works with every model, okay? So here you have some model made in Blender. Let me shift, for example, to this thing, and I can export it to GLTF. And I would do it by choosing some directory, um, like this. I did try it before the presentation, but, yes, but right before it. And now I can first of all open it in my viewer. Okay, as you can see, it looks very much similar to what we have made in Blender, except lighting, right? Because in GLTF, the punctual lights are uh, not in the standard. They are an extension of GLTF. If you want to export from Blender to GLTF, including lighting, well, you have to just select this checkbox, punctual lights. And now we will have a model that includes also lighting, and this will make it much, much brighter, okay, so like this. And uh, yeah, you can use, you can include this GLTF model into inside X3D in, well, kind of the same way as we have done with the soldier. Let me actually do something crazy. So let me replace this thing with this thing. Let me also increase the distances here. Kocha miseczka is a Polish term for a bowl of uh, food for a cat. Just in case you're wondering. Okay, and now we will have an XVD model that includes uh, four copies of this amazing model that we have made. <laughs> and it works. Mm, okay, uh, what more did I want to show? Actually, that's it about XVD and GLTF. I also did want to show how you can do some of this stuff inside my engine. So this will just be a quick presentation. What do we have here? So we have something like an editor where we can visually design stuff that can be later executed in your game. Here I have loaded an almost empty design and almost empty means that it has an empty 3D space where I can place where stuff based stuff, I mean 3D models, of course. And for example, I can add here a plane. And now I can move, oh, so that's a zoom window. Okay, so I can, I have added the plane to my, uh, yes, yes. Oh, right. So I have added a plane to my scene, okay? This is this plane. Um, I can show or hide it, I can customize its color. Uh, but the real point I want to show is that, well, of course, oh, and, and I can choose the material type for it, which corresponds to the X3D nodes that I'm showing. So there's a phone material, there's a physical material and so on. And of course you can load various scenes and each scene is just a 3D model. So for example, I can use the scene from a, uh, XVD file or from GLTF file, I have exported it before. So this is the scene that I have exported from Blender, uh, well, from the model that you have just saw, okay? So you can kind of compose your scene from all these models. Let me do like this. Uh, let me actually choose another scene, maybe the soldier one would be a bit more sensible, okay? So I can choose the models, GLTF or X3D models. I can play various animations of these models. I can duplicate them in any way I'd like. I can also experiment with lighting. So I can add here the, for example, the, let's maybe start with the spotlight actually. So this is the spotlight that shines on the scene and I can rotate it. And the point I'm making here is that I, I not only just want to show my engine, but I want to emphasize that everything I show here is just an XVD model 
And even if it's GLTF model, then it's still an XVD model because it's converted to a number of XVD nodes under the hood for displaying. So for example, the thing that I'm operating right now, well, this is a spotlight. It's a regular XVD node of a spotlight that is kind of wrapped in the engine in something, well, nice, easy to manipulate with some easy components for attenuation, beam width, and so on and so on. But inside everything you see here is just an XVD node performing animation, performing rendering, and everything else. Mm, and I do think that's it. And I think I'm almost on time. <laughs> uh, I, I think I was supposed to go a 15 minutes shorter, but not that bad for me. Uh, so that's it. Now it's time for the QA. I actually, I, I, and I do have time. So if you also have time, I would welcome now everybody to ask questions. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Michaelis. There are a couple of questions here, but first of all, I would like to thank you for this great presentation. Uh, Michaelis has played a key role in uh, converging GLTF and uh, X3D in uh, X3D 4.0. And we would like to thank him for that. And uh, I also would like to add, uh, before we start the Q&A, we have the 2022 series coming up. We'll have webinars every month, mostly showcasing our technologies and our member use cases. Uh, so please, we'll be sending you invitations. Please plan to join us every month. And let's go to Q&A now. <laughs> so there are a couple of questions here within the chat here. Michaelis, would you like to start from there? Sure. Uh, oh, thank you for posting the link. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think the lead is kind of useful. And it also allows the browser to make a more efficient rendering easily. XVD has a default. Ah, uh, yes, uh, XVD has a default point light, uh, actually directional light behind the camera. There is a node called navigation info. Ah, let me just start sharing again. Uh, indeed, there is a node called navigation info in XVD that specifies whether you have this headlight by default. So of course you can turn it off. But yes, by default, you, you have it. Let me just show you this. Uh, very quickly, navigation component, navigation info, and it has a headlight boolean field. If you would like to turn it off in your scene, then what you would do is you would open, well, you would open XVD file, you would add there this navigation info node, and you would say headlight, sorry, headlight false. And that's it, but that's all you have to do to like disable this default headlight. It's, it's just a default feature. So I hope this answers this. Let me look for more questions. Uh, yes, uh, there's a number of software that I do not have yet a perfect answer how to import there. I mean, uh, Maya, for example, has an exporter from Maya to GLTF. We actually have a page that describes the process how to export from Maya to GLTF. Uh, ah, let me then start sharing again. Sure. So, so if you're looking at the like interoperability, I guess one thing I should mention is that we have an exporter from Bender to XVD. But for example, Maya or 3ds Max, they do not have directly a way to export into XVD. But then you can use like all this knowledge like from the stock, which is that well, you can actually export it to GLTF and then use GLTF, include this GLTF within XVD. And for example, for Maya, uh, there's one version is to export GLTF using Babylon and another possibility actually, actually very good uh, is to export from Maya to FBX, which is an Adobe proprietary format, but then you can convert from FBX to GLTF. It sounds like a bother because you have this extra format, FBX, in the middle, but well, fortunately, the tool to convert it is actually very good and the results are actually, yeah, very good. So that's, that's a way how you can interact with Maya. I do have to admit that I don't know about Keyshot, Rhino 7. I heard about Adobe Substance, but I also don't know how to get the models from it. But my guess is this is that GLTF has kind of a big coverage right now. So if you're interested in using these things with XVD and you don't find anything ready to 
get XPD content from them, then export to GLTF or export to FBX, FBX, and then export FBX to GLTF. And you can use then all these things inside XVD. That is kind of, I think, actually, I'm, uh, that is also uh, one of the reasons why I'm like very much focused on supporting GLTF and XVD throughout my engine, because it just gives you a lot more possibilities when you support all of them. Uh, oh, and thank you, Nicolas, you already answered the question about the headlight. Uh, to convert XVD to GLTF. Mm, about the Python binding, good question, I don't know. I know that there is some uh, information on the XVD public mailing list about the Python bindings. Um, I don't know if they are featured to a point uh, to render something or that they are featured to a point to convert XVD to GLTF. So a good question, I don't know. Um, thanks, in most, yes, and indeed, yes. In most GLTF renders the image-based lighting, the environment lighting is kind of used by default, yes. In case of XVD, we use by default the directional lighting, which I guess there's uh, just because of history, yes. And Nicholas is right, absolutely. Of course, Blender, Blender itself is a Python API. So yeah, actually you can just use the Python API in Blender to import XVD in Blender and export GLTF from Blender. It may even be just two lines of Python code in Blender. Well, thank you very much. So that's a better answer than mine. Yeah, thank you. I think this covers the question from the chat. Anything more? <laughs> thank you. Nicholas, do you want to add anything here? Well, I just wanted to say thank you, and uh, I'm going to go back to um, teaching my class here. We've enjoyed um, Michaelis's introduction to X3D, and um, so thanks, everyone, from uh, the senior capstone design at Virginia Tech, and thank you again, Michaelis. We'll talk to you soon. One last thing I would like to add is uh, from the examples that Michaelis showed us today, X3D is like a presentation layer where we are bringing uh, content from different formats, bringing into this presentation layer, adding animation, adding interaction. So it's really it really gives you an open platform to bring content and data from different formats, from different domains. Yes, I definitely want to like emphasize it too, that I, I was showing one browser, my browser, I'm biased, but there are like uh, at least four active implementations of XVD, open source or not, and more than 10 implementations in various active stage. And they support pretty much all the platforms you can imagine, web, desktop, mobile, everything. Okay, thank you everyone for joining and I, we hope to see you at our next webinar, which is on April 29th. Um, see you then and go to our website to register for our next webinar. Thanks, Michaelis. Thanks, Nicholas. <laughs> Thank see you, you very much. Time. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.